Um, welcome to today's leadership forum. My name is Rachel Itzo. I'm an undergraduate research fellow at the Center for Growth and Opportunity, also known as the CGO. And I have the honor of introducing our panelists today. And they couldn't be more perfect to talk to us about this topic. And we will be speaking about leadership in business, politics, and public service. First, I'd like to introduce Dave Patel. Dave has worked in the political sphere because he started his career in Washington, DC. He worked in the office of a senator and um, in the office of the Secretary of Defense. And then he's also worked in the business sector. He was key in transforming a large trade association. So he knows a thing or two about leadership in business and politics. But at his roots, Dave is an Aggie. He, both he and his wife graduated from Utah State. And after a 15 year career in DC, he found his way back to Logan and is now here with us. He's the Associate Dean for Student and External Affairs, as well as the Director for, Hunts, for the Huntsman Scholar Program. So his office is just down, down the hallway. Um, you might have seen him around. <laughs> um, and then he will be leading our discussion with Mia Love, and Mia Love is incredible. She is a former U US representative for Utah. So she knows better than anyone in this room what really happens in Congress. Um, she was the first Republican black woman to serve in Congress, as well as um, Utah's first woman black mayor. And she was the mayor in Saratoga Springs. And she also has close connection to, connections to us Aggies. Um, two of her daughters are students here at Utah State. And she's recently started to work together with the Center for Growth and Opportunity, and she's their national outreach director. So that means that she's going to help us to effectively communicate our research, um, our economic policy research, to legislators and policymakers. We're super happy to have her at the CGO. And as a fellow at the CGO, I've had the opportunity to interact with me a little bit already. And let me tell you, you're in for a treat. It's going to be a fantastic discussion. So both of our guests have had years of experience in DC, and they've become effective leaders in their careers, wherever their career took them. On top of that, they really care about us, us Aggies. They want to see us succeed. So I couldn't think of anyone better to speak to us about leadership in business, politics, and public service. Please join me in welcoming Dave Patel and Mia Love. Thank you very much. This is my BFF Mia. Yes. We're just going to talk. Feel free to interject. <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> You're like You're in for a treat. Is everyone, I mean, everyone's pretty quiet this morning. We're going to have some fun, guys. We're not going to be boring. Don't worry. They're being but. super respectful. Oh. Because they're scared of me. <laughs> so, uh, Mia, thank you for driving up from Happy Valley this morning. I see your daughter's here. I did text your son-in-law. Did you? Slacker is not here. <laughs> Former Huntsman student, Lincoln Archibald. Let's just call him out when he does come in. Yeah, we'll say, welcome. <laughs> so I want to start, um, if I can, uh, just piggybacking on what Sarah just talked about. Um, you've got a lot going on now with CNN, um, The View, this show on television. I don't own one, so sorry. Um, and with Georgetown. So with all of that, um, how did you come to connect with USU and with our Center for Growth and Opportunity? Okay, so it's really interesting because it's actually a little bit more than that. Um, we are, uh, I'm on two boards, bank boards, um, I, which I love because the thing that I was missing in Washington was that policy, financial services part of it, so I get to fill that niche. It's one of the only things I miss about Washington. Um, I do miss some of my friends there, so I have to say that. In terms of the fighting, I don't miss any of that. Um, Georgetown, I was a fellow at Georgetown. Um, I ended that semester and uh, really, um, I ended up getting an offer at University of Southern California and I turned that down so I could focus on Utah State. I said, this is where my heart is, right? I have two girls that go to Utah State and that this is where my money is, too. <laughs> so I had to invest all of my time in um, Utah State. But, you know, I, um, 
actually my former chief of staff, Ivan, works with the Center for Growth and Opportunity. And um, he just kind of, we had a meeting. Just We just happened to meet up for lunch at one of my favorite places, Sol Agave. You guys haven't been there. It's really good. They've got some great watermelon virgin margaritas that I would just tell you it's so good. Just make sure you emphasize virgin margaritas because they will like light it up. Um, <laughs> and where is Sol Agave? Just it, it's in Utah County in American Fork. Just saying, if you're ever there, go to Sol Agave. It's so good. I'm, I endorse it. We're um, already deviating into. In I know we are, but know. but but this is why we shared a love for really good food. And when I heard about what CGO was doing in terms of um, policy policy research, I just thought to myself, it would be a shame if all of the work that these students are doing, the people that really need to hear it really didn't hear it. And so um, I've made some really good connections with people on both sides of the aisle that I felt this really good research really should be getting in the hands of um, some of these people. And uh, so, and I love working with students. I actually like working with students more than grown, no offense. <laughs> um, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done now. <laughs> because you know their their um, their 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 minds are just open, and um, I feel like that's where our hope is. So that's great. So can you t tell us a little bit more about what it, that? I mean, Megan, uh, uh, um, Rachel, is Rachel that? touched on that. Um, what does a national outreach director you know, do for the CGO? Okay, so that was the best title that we could find. <laughs> but but I guess it's exactly what it what it says. I um I take some of the research, and we've actually been to Washington already and um, introduced the uh, the um, center to people like Cedric Richmond, who is the senior um, advisor to the president. Um, and a really good friend of mine, he was a former chairman for the Congressional Black Caucus. We've uh, introduced CGO to uh, Marsha Fudge, who is the Secretary of HUD, who is also um, a former member of the CGO, and she's kind of like my big sister, even though we are completely on opposite ends politically. And Kevin McCarthy, who is the minority leader. So people in Washington already know about CGO and um, our next, uh, the next thing that we're going to do is, in January is go in and start talking about immigration policy to some of the senators and some of the committee hearing staffs that we need to get it in front of. So they can use the information that we have to actually form some really good policy. That's great, thank you. So most people here know you as a member of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, you were the mayor of Saratoga Springs. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get started in politics? I, I read that there was an issue in your neighborhood with flies. Okay, let's, let's be very clear. This is not something I said I wanted to do when I grow up, okay? I wasn't like this little girl walking around in like a tiara and a tutu saying, I'm going to be a politician. No. Um, it, it's, I, I still blame my neighbors for getting me into this mess. Um, but... I lived in a neighborhood that felt really, that was really on the outskirts of Saratoga Springs. We really didn't feel like anybody was listening to us. As a matter of fact, we went to a city council meeting once talking about the bugs that were coming in from the lake and they really didn't want to do anything about it. And one city council member said, well, we really, you guys really should be in Lehigh anyway. You really shouldn't be in Saratoga Springs. And that's when I about like red flag, and I went into fight mode. So um, my neighbor said, well, one of us has to run for city council. And um, we did, and we actually, I knew, I had no name recognition. People had no idea who I was, you know. Um, and we came in first, and I got on the city council, and then I shook things up. <laughs> and that led to Congress. And then that led to, well, we had a, <laughs> no. Um, so, of course, you know, uh, this is important to say because I think it's easy to be a mayor, a city council member, a member of Congress, when things are going well, right? When things are going well, it's easy. But it's when the crap hits the fan that you know what people are made of. And so we went through the housing crisis. I was actually telling people, little old me was saying, listen, Saratoga Springs, we cannot build our city based on um, building permits, right? 
uh, impact fees. So Saratoga Springs, the main, they had no tax base. We didn't even have a police department. We didn't have a fire department. Um, we had zero tax base at all. We had two roads coming in and out of, well, actually two road, main roads in the city, main roads. Um, one was the state road and the other one was um, a state road also. And so we really didn't have to maintain those roads. We just had to maintain the neighborhood roads. And so they never saw a need for a tax base and they were pretty much doing all of their finances through impact fees. Those are everyone who moves in, pays an impact fee, a park impact fee, a road impact fee, a house impact fee. Well, I don't know if that means anything to you, but I guess the basic idea is, I, I always said you cannot run a city when you've got one-time revenues paying for ongoing expenditures. One-time revenue should be paying for one-time expenditures. Ongoing revenue should be paying for ongoing expenditures. And I also said as a uh, council member, we shouldn't really be paying for anything that is not affordable, not sustainable, and not our job. Um, and then the housing market, the crisis hit, and all of those impact fees were gone. And Saratoga Springs saw a financial crisis that for a small growing city was absolutely impossible for them. And so I didn't say, see, I told you so, because nobody has time to do that. I had to roll up my sleeves and fix things. And that was a lot of cutting um, and also build the first tax base that just paid for public safety, police, and, and everything else had to be on an ongoing revenue. So um, utilities paid for utilities, water paid for water. Um, we had to make sure that we had enough just in case there was an emergency, if, which obviously those came in handy. And the last thing I did, and I know this is, again, a long conversation, but the last thing I did was instead of everybody having a budget meeting once a year, I said, we're going to have quarterly meetings. I want to know where you are in the budget, how you're doing, so we're on track. Because what was happening in Saratoga Springs is we were hiring all of these inspectors, all of this staff based on future projections. Well, things change in the middle of the year, and they're still hiring people. So I wanted to know what we needed when we needed to make sure that we weren't over hiring or under, right? So uh, to me, it was running a city like you run a household, um, making sure that you have enough, you balance your budgets. It's, it's novel, not rocket science. It's a novel concept. It's a novel concept. It's not rocket science like what some of you are doing. <laughs> literally, like yeah. my daughter's literally doing rocket science. We should have her here. She, yeah, she should be sitting. Both of them actually should <laughs> be sitting here. Because I bet you, any of you here, if you know how to run a household, you know how to run, like it, it just, it's, Washington does none of that, so. So, let's talk about Congress, but I want to um, compare and contrast your, uh, how you felt about it. So as a mayor, Mm -hmm. Right, as an executive of even a small town. Yeah. How did that compare to being one of 435? Night and day. Night and day. Um, if I, so here's what's great about municipal government it's nonpartisan, right? If, and, and all of the issues in the 12 years that, that I was in local government, um, not one issue was a Republican Democrat issue. You couldn't say, hey, by the way, I'm going to like, you know, fix the potholes on one side of the street and not the other. Most people that were coming in, there were community issues because we were all, our kids were going to the same school. We were all dealing with com community issues. And the other thing is um, you can get things done like this, right? You, you have five, mem five members of um, the council that you're dealing with. And if something needed to be dealt with, I would put it on the agenda which was great. It's almost like the Speaker of the House, right? Mm -hmm. You can put it on the agenda. I didn't have to wait for a committee mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and we would have people come in, give us their suggestions, and uh, we could fix the problem within weeks. Or within a week, we can start at least fixing the problem. But in Washington, there, there's a politics um, is first and foremost. And it makes it very difficult, which is why we have policy at the 11th hour, which is why we don't deal with our fiscal issues till December. This is exactly what's going to happen. I mean, we're dealing with reconciliation right mm -hmm. now, right? What happened every year, ask my kids, it's like, I'm trying to get home. They're like, no, we've got to figure out how we're going to like, you know, pay, uh, 
pay our bills. And um, we know it's coming, but nobody deals with it at the beginning of the year or at least for the next foreseeable future. In Saratoga Springs, I was able to make sure that our community was financially viable, not just for the next four to five years, but for the next 40 to 50 years. It took a little bit of work, but you can actually do that. Right. Most politicians, they want things to look good um, when they're in office, right? They're like, hey, if, as long as I can fix things while I'm here, I'm good, but I really don't care about what's going on in the future. A lot of politicians are like, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so, so that's maybe a little bit of hindsight, right? Yeah. But when you first went to Congress. Yeah. Right. When I first went to Congress. Um, 2015. Yeah. It was really interesting, the mixed bag of people that you get. You, you're so in awe, right? You, you walk around and you're just like, wow, this is so crazy. How did I get here? And then you meet some like crazy people that, and then you're like, how the heck did you get here? Like, what, what is going on? Like, <laughs> wait, there are, are 670,000 plus people elected you. That's crazy. Um, but, you know, it, it just, it really, uh, the House of Representatives is the branch of government that's supposed to be closest, you know, to people on, uh, on the federal level. And so you'll find that the people that are there really are reflective of, you know, of the people in their district. Like, Hank Johnson, um, you should look him up, look up his song. Just do, do yourself a favor, look up Hank Johnson for Congress song. Um, you know, those are things that actually work in his district, right? Um, and, and he was nice to me, so I mean, but he was a funny guy. But he, he, it's just, you're, you, you see a mixed group of people and 435, it's, it's a lot of people. It's, it's different than five. Yeah. So. Yeah. Takes a lot of leadership. Takes a to lot of get leadership. Anything done. Yeah, and you have to understand too. Anybody, a lot of people go into Congress thinking, oh yeah, I just won an election, I'm a big deal. But I mean, they all did too, right? And so um, the best way to gain respect is to not be a show pony, but to be a workhorse and to learn that you're there to work. And so um, everybody there thinks that they're great because they just went through this big thing. But, you know, you have to roll up your sleeves and you have to be a little humble, open your ears, close your mouth a little bit yeah. and, and see where other people are coming from. That's where that's how you gain respect in Washington. I think that's exactly right. Um, last time me and I talked, I told her a story that my first boss in D.C., Senator uh, Hatch, used to say this was back in the day. It's not the same today as we talked about. But he said that the Democrats are the opposition. The House is the enemy. Um, and that used to be, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. sort of balance of power, three yeah. branches of government. But even inside the legislature, that's sort of the natural uh, push-pull yeah. in the Senate and the House. Yeah. But there's only 100 in the Senate, only 100, versus 435. So it's a little bit easier. Yeah to get things done. And the House, things move really quickly. Every two years, like, right? you're just, yeah. and, and But no, I'm talking about physically. You go in the House and people are rushing back and forth in the Senate. It's because like elevator older. music. And they've got canes and they're just like, I was like, don't you guys have somewhere to go? Like, I swear, after 10 o'clock, the Senate floor smells like bourbon and Bengay. <laughs> it's like. It's, and there's the quote from today. <laughs> So you talked uh, a little bit earlier about Cedric. So I want to talk yeah. a little bit about um, creating relationships, not just inside your party, but across the aisle, because we just don't see or hear that anymore. I think yeah, that's, that's, that's changed. So how did you do that? Um, how did you come to associate with the Congressional Black Caucus, which historically has really been dominated by just one side of the aisle? It, it still is, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and you've said that you even count as a today mentors, some people who, with whom you uh, disagree politically. Yeah. So how, you know. How does that happen? Yeah. Well, first of all, I and think. And why do we, why do we care? Why, why should we keep doing that? Okay. So uh, I, I want to tell this story later. So remind me of this. Um, but I learned from a really good friend of mine, Peyton Manning. Does anybody know Peyton? He said, um, being a quarterback is difficult, and he said leaders, though, 
um, put themselves in very uncomfortable positions and they have to get really comfortable there. In other words, he put himself in the middle of a whole bunch of people trying to bury him into the ground and he has to become very stable and comfortable there. And it stuck with me. And so um, when I was going to join the Congressional Black Caucus, everybody was just like, don't do it. You know, you're there. It's not going to do anything. They're going to hate you. You know, they're, you're the only Republican there. And being the first black Republican female um, ever elected to Congress, I felt like um, I needed to at least go in and see what kind of relationship or if I can affect any change there. And I have to tell you, um, uh, there was a point where um, I was just sitting down and talking to Cedric. Actually, my husband was with me. And he looked at me. He's like, we get along so well. I, I, how are you a Republican? Like, what, what, what made you decide that you were going to put an R behind your name? even though we all know that you don't always agree with everything that Republicans do, right? Um, but you, that it's the party you most affiliate with. And I said, you know, coming, my parents coming from Haiti and dealing with one dictator after another dictator, I grew up with my dad telling me stories about how governments were way too powerful and that people really couldn't, they had no voice in Haiti. Um, and so when he came to the United States, all he wanted to do was be able to work and provide for his kids. The American dream wasn't get rich, right? The American dream was I'm going to educate my children and I'm going to feed them. And I'm going to be able to do something that I wasn't able to do in Haiti. So I said my dad, you know, through those stories and just through some of the principles that I grew up with, I felt, and being a mayor and a city council member, the most effective solutions are found at the most local level and closer to people. To me, it was really about government for, by, and of people, right? And he's just like, okay, okay, I understand that. And I said, well, what about you? And he said, well, I grew up in the South where it wasn't, it wasn't the, um, the, the local governments were actually keeping people mm -hmm. back. He's like, I grew up with my parents not being able to vote. We had to march um, with people that were really, I mean, right in the middle, his parents right in the middle of the civil rights movement where, um, you know, family members were getting beaten, jailed. And he's just like, it was the local governments and it was the federal government that actually helped us get the rights that we needed. It changed my perspective and I've learned this. People are a, um, they're a product of their DNA, what your body, um, the neural connections tell you to do, your environment, your, where, where you are, um, where you're born, and information, right? The information and the experience that you've gained. And if I were in his shoes growing up just like him, I would be doing the exact same thing. So if you want to expand your sphere of knowledge, understand that you don't know everything, that you have to really pay attention to what somebody else is doing and what they're saying. And then you can get a full perspective. You may not always agree, but we got to the point where these people, Marsha, Cedric, they would come to me on the floor and say, don't vote for this, Mia. This is, this is all about politics. We don't need you. This is not good for you. Like they were really telling me not to vote for something that they were voting for because they were trying to protect me. And they felt like um, we can trust her. And in turn, they also felt like they had one voice in the Republican conference. So when we were dealing with tax issues, for instance, they're like, we can't vote for this, but Mia, if you can get um, a tax credit for taking care of the elderly, we would really love that. That would be at least something that we could, you know, that would be helpful to all of our communities. And I agreed with it and I pushed it. So a lot of people, Paul, Kevin, they don't know that that actually came from the CBC. But the CBC actually had a voice at that time in the Republican conference. And it's unfortunate that there is none of that anymore. It is unfortunate. In Senator Hatch's front office, there was a watercolor painting of Hyannisport that Senator Ted Kennedy had painted himself. And the inscription was, to Oren, we'll always leave the light on for you, Ted. That does not happen anymore. It's, and that's it's too bad for our country, right? So let's talk about Haiti. Hmm. It's- Seriously sad. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just saw uh, a headline two days ago about State Department uh, telling Americans to consider uh, leaving. So, and it's unfortunately, right, that's the only time most of us think about Haiti. Mm -hmm. Some earthquake, hurricane, some political instability ravages the country, but has an amazing story. Mm. Um, including the fact that a slave-led rebellion succeeded in defeating the most powerful empires of the day, the Spanish, the French, and the British, to create the independent state that became Haiti. That this is in our backyard, right? We all talk about going to the Caribbean, and Haiti gets forgotten in there, right? This is here. These are our neighbors. So what, tell us about your continuing ties uh, to Haiti. Oh gosh, where do I begin? Um, so just a little bit of that background. Again, these are, I know the stories of how Haiti got started. Haiti was the first little island to gain, to gain its independence. And Haiti led other islands to be able mm. to do that. So when um, what, there was a major massacre, right, um, where the the French were completely, I mean, they, they, they destroyed them. So they decided, hmm, we can't have this happen because word will get out with all of these other islands. And they started adding them uh, um, to members of parliament, not voting members of parliament, but represent, re having some representation in, in their government. So they started, work they didn't want to leave because the islands were fertile, right? They were making a lot of money on these islands. So they said, instead of keeping our thumbs on them, why don't we become partners and at least allow them to have a voice and set the slaves free so we don't have what happened in Haiti happen. So just so you know, um, a lot of times people don't realize that there is, a, there, there is always a positive and also a sacrifice mm. that you make with every major decision like this or every major event like this. And the sacrifice that Haiti had to make was the fact that they all of a sudden were a free country without any representation anywhere and having to govern themselves after years and years of slavery. And what I mean by years of slavery, please understand this very clearly. It's not like you were forced to work for somebody. You were stripped of your entire identity. You were told not just told, but made to feel like you were less than an animal, their pets. So to come from that and to all of a sudden be on your own, it, you could see how it led to one person rising and then not really understanding that that meant, that service meant sacrifice. You know, if, you, if all you know are kings, then you get, and there's no checks on the power. It's true. Power corrupts, absolutely, right? No matter how kind and nice you are. So they dealt with one dictator after another, after another, after another. And so whoever was at the top was always bleeding the bottom. So, I mean, if you look at what's going on with Haiti, um, I've tried to work with Haiti, not just on the legislative side with the former president who, um, has been assassined, um, um, Maurice, he, he was a good, um, from what I know and my experience, a great person. And unfortunately, if you are not corrupt and you are not paying people off and you're not, there's this, there's this um, environment there that you just, the, 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 the corrupt is too much, right? You pay people off, you do what you need to do, um, or they eliminate you. Um, so I don't even really know where to begin. I started with OUR. I think that that's where my focus has been. If I can't help them get their government straight, at least I can help to learn about um, trafficking and um, human trafficking with children. So, and the more that we learn about Haiti and how that works in Haiti, the more we can stop it from the United States. Because if you don't think those are tied you're, you're kidding yourself, right? Um, and also um, in making sure that any funding that we give to Haiti, that they weren't going into the wrong hands, which happens more often than not, right? So you give aid, you give funding, and it ends up in the hands of corrupt because, you're, you know, it's hard to track that. So 
I don't know if that's, I mean, I, I, we can go into border, we can go into all of these yeah. other things, but Haiti, it's very, it's really, really sad. And one more thing I want to say, because I think that this is the most important thing. If you don't think, this is why I love working with students, because I, if, if there's one thing I want you to remember today, is if you think that the United States is immune from that type of life, government, livelihood, then you're wrong. What makes us, this is why it's so important to preserve the things that we have here in the United States. We, if we really neglect the things that make this country great, we neglect our constitution, we neglect the foundation of this country, you can look, no, you don't have to look any further than Venezuela. We are not immune from that type of life, okay? That's why this country is worth fighting for. And every single one of you have these talents that you're given and they're not for you. They have to be used for the benefit of society. All of you have something that you can contribute to this country and to your community. That's, that's a perfect pivot. So let's, let's talk about leadership. Yeah. From being mayor to being a member of Congress to your experience with Haiti and what you just talked about. Um, so what does leadership mean to you? Okay, so we talked about this a little. I think this is the perfect time to talk about this Peyton Manning story, right? So I um, was mayor of Saratoga Springs and uh, Mitt Romney was running for president um, at that time with Paul Ryan. Um, Paul came to, uh, I, I was dealing with some things as a mayor, but I was um, invited to Park City for this event that they were at. And um, uh, gosh, I was a, still a big football fan. And I was at a table. So understand my mindset. Paul was with his wife, Jana. Mitt was with his wife, Anne. Tad was there with his wife. And then I was there with Peyton Manning. So we were practically on a date, <laughs> right? I was practically his date. So I don't know, guys, I don't get starstruck but this was a train wreck. So I'm sitting next to Peyton like this, and I'm looking at him, and the first words out of my mouth is, I name my son after you. <laughs> and he's like, and he looks, because he's got this like neck thing, right? So he had this like, his neck was fused, and he turns around to me, and he's like, you did? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he's just like, and I said, his name is Peyton William Love. He's like, my middle name is William. And I was like, yeah, but don't, I said, but don't worry. I didn't do the last name. It's Peyton William Love, not Peyton William Manning. Like, I, I kept my last name for him. And he's like, that's good. And then I see this happening. I'm like, Mia, shut up. Don't say anything. Like, stop. And I was like, well, I've got to get myself out of this. So the next line, you're safe. I'm a mayor. You have no, like, they wouldn't put you here if you didn't. Then he's like, that's good to know. And so he's eating soup, right? And I'm thinking, OK, so I'm quiet at this point. And that's awkward, too. And he's eating like soup. This was like chicken noodle soup. And I, and I find myself staring at him, waiting for him to finish so I'm not getting him mid like. And I'm like. And the next words were, do you and Tom Brady get along? <laughs> After a while, I just let it go, and then that's where he, you know, started talking about leadership. He talked to me about leadership, and um, and I think I kind of redeemed myself just by listening. But thank goodness, we actually went to a retreat, a Republican retreat, where I had all of my kids there, and it was during a horrible time. By the way, there were protests everywhere. Trump was became the president. And um, he came in to speak with us, and he was literally scared out of his mind because the whole entire block was covered with protesters. And he came in, and, um, and they were literally wanting to take his head off. Like, he, they were tweeting about him, doing all of these other things. And, you know, I looked at him, and I said, you said to me once, you know, leaders put themselves in uncomfortable positions and get comfortable there. So here you are. And I said, by the way, I remember the son that I named out there. This is Peyton right here. <laughs> and he 
And by the way, we're cool because, you know, if I weren't like, if I were crazy, I wouldn't be a member of Congress now. So anyway, he signed my son's ball. And I think we're, I think we're okay. You know, I think he knows that. He'll be here next week. Yeah. <laughs> but that, you know, I, it, when it comes to leadership, I think that people, this is the thing I want to say again, is that I've learned that really good leadership in three rules. One, put yourself in uncomfortable positions, get yourself comfortable there. Two, good leadership is not when things are bright, the sun's shining, but it's when the storm comes and you have to navigate through it, right? A really good captain is not one that can, you know, navigate through calm seas. It's one that can actually get an entire um, crew through, right? Through some heavy storms. And the last thing I would um, say that leadership is, it, it's not, leadership is not standing up on a pedestal saying, I'm going to make these decisions and you need to listen to me. It's also knowing who to have around you to make sure that you are, you are a successful. Because I uh, honestly, I, I could not have been on financial services with the experience I had. I had to have some really good experienced people around me to help me navigate through some of those things. In other words, know that you have to expand your sphere of knowledge. You become more effective that way. Not by, you, you, leaders help others rise, right? If there is a situation where somebody gets this much and somebody gets this, that's a win-win. Leaders are always looking for a win-win situation and always helping to bring people up. That's fantastic. So I wanna leave some time for um, questions question? from students. So I just have one last question. Okay. Um, is it so, a good one, hard one? Super. By the way, my son-in-law came, so there he is. We thought we told we told Lincoln him. Archibald, everybody. Everybody, Lincoln's Yay. here. <laughs> you didn't know I was gonna do that. Did you? <laughs> it's a super hard question. Okay. You've never been asked this before. Okay. What advice do you have for these students? As a parent and as with life experiences. Okay. I'm glad you asked that because um, Gosh, this may be controversial, but you know, I, it's not controversial. Just think of it as we can turn the video completely. off. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. It's not controversial. I'm joking. Um, because it's it's something that I feel very strongly about. I think the problem, some of the biggest problems we have in society, is that there are a lot of people that want to do the thinking for you. Um, Washington is not about. Um, giving you the ability to make decisions for yourself. It's about retaining power. If you look at what I'm talking about in terms of the power struggle, it's what party has the most power. And they're so focused on that that they really can't get things across the aisle, right? Um, and you look at the fights right now, and the fights are, gosh, we have all, we have um, control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. Let's try and push as much through. There aren't very many people that are saying, wait a minute, let's see, let's try and get some really good um, you know, bipartisan or even some really good solutions. And we, as people, are left out of it. So the advice I would give you is this. Think for yourself. If you are not standing up, if you are not showing up, if you are not thinking through these issues for yourself, Someone inferior to you is going to do it for you. If you leave that vacuum open, you better believe somebody is going to do it for you, and it's never going to be in your best interest. As humans, we do. We do what is in our best interest, in our family's best interest. So nobody is better to lead your life than you. And if you are absent from that, somebody else is going to do it for you. Don't take somebody's word for it when they say, hey, by the way, this is what's going on in the United States, and this is, this is how things are, and this is what we should do. Think for yourself. Do not let your brain atrophy, because it can. If you're not using it, you'll lose it. Does that make sense? Don't let anyone think for you. Don't just sit there and take what somebody says, whether it's on TV, and I'm in the media, right? Whether it's on TV, whether it's in even books, it's somebody else's opinion. You are going to be the author of your own life. And what you do, you want to make sure that when people read about you or when people talk about you, you were the one that authored that, not somebody else.
please, please, please think for yourself. Make informed decisions based on what you feel and what you have calculated in your mind. That's perfect. Thank you. Let's open it up for questions from the audience. We've got a mic here. Raise your hand. And when you get the mic, state your name and major. Oh, come on. Ask some good ones. All the way back there. <laughs> Ryan Smith. Once one person asks, then everybody will start to, oh, yeah, I'm going to ask this. So this is more a political question, but what are your thoughts on the future of the Republican Party and what direction do you think they should take? And specifically, like, specifically with students and the younger generation? Well, um, I would say this. First of all, you know, there are a lot of people, I mean, obviously there have been a lot of controversy uh, surrounding the former president and, you know, even now, like this president, right? Um, there's always going to be, uh, I just, the future of the Republican Party is going to be based on, I think, not people abdicating. I refuse to abdicate um, what I believe in. But also, I'm the type of person that is not going to put all of my eggs in one basket. Our job is not to follow an individual. Our job is to follow a set of principles and even a platform that, um, that we believe in and hold those individuals accountable to that principle and that platform, which is why you've seen me outspoken about anybody, right? If I believe that they are doing things that are against the principles that I think are good for the United States or good for people, I'll speak up. And I don't care what party you're part of. So the future of the party is going to be built based on how many people are willing to stand in their principles and in their platform and not go along just because somebody says, hey, that is the leader. I remember all the time people are like, would say to me, well, you need to stand behind the president. I was like, he needs to stand behind me. I wasn't elected by him. I was elected by um, a group of constituents, around 671,000 people, that expect me to do what's best for them, not him. And, um, and I, I think that if the way, if we have more people like that, like Youngkin, who really did a great job in Virginia, he actually did it based on local issues, education, um, uh, parents having more, uh, more of the ability to make decisions, the economy. I mean, how many people are like going to the grocery? I don't know how many people do their own groceries here, but I do. How many people are going to the groceries saying that they're spending hundreds of dollars um, buying groceries and you're leaving with half empty bags of, of food or groceries? I mean, how many of you guys have walked out and said, what the heck did I buy? Right? You're going to the gas station. Everybody's feeling those same things. And you focus. If, if we focus on those issues, local issues, then I think that everything's going to be fine. This is not the first time that people said, oh my gosh, the party's good. It's dead. It's not. And that's, you're going to, it's cyclical. It's going to continue to happen. What I fear is that in this cycle, it's about who has power up here. And while that's happening, people are losing power because it's all being consolidated um, in Washington. So I know that was a lot, but I'll try and keep them shorter. <laughs> It's a great question. Hello, uh, my name is Jay Spingham, and I'm studying international business. Um, you talked you're about studying, sorry? international business. Okay. Uh, you talked about how a lot of times power leads to corruption. So <clears throat> uh, my question is, uh, as you've kind of gained more and more power and influence and expanded that sphere of influence, how have you been able to focus on those good principles? And maybe on the flip side, what factors have you seen that, uh, that led people to corruption? Okay, so um, first of all, um, being close to my family is always incredibly humbling. So I always base decisions on what, am I going to be able to sleep at night? Am I going to be a person that my children can be proud of? Um, and I also kept in my mind a set of rules for myself. And for me, it was, is it affordable? Is it sustainable? Is it my job? Um, those 
were the things that kept me from thinking that I was, you know, that I was too big for this or I was. My job was to all, always feel like when I leave this place and I go back to being, you know, a, which I was always a mom, but go back to normal life because life up there is not normal or around over there. I shouldn't say up there. Over there is not like normal, right? Um, that I would feel like I did more for families in my community than I did for myself there. Um, and what that means, like every year, for instance, I, in every cycle I introduced a policy, a, a bill called One Subject at a Time, which meant that every law enacted by Congress needed to be limited to one subject and that one subject needed to be clearly stated in the title. Because too many, and by the way, people, on both sides of the aisle. I had progressives and um, conservatives love that bill. You know who didn't love that bill? Members of Congress. Because they were like, well, I need the bridge to nowhere and I can't get it unless I get, I have this person put that bill. I just felt like if we weren't, the, the issues needed to be debated on their own merits and if they failed on those merits, then they couldn't be added to another bill. That would require a lot of work for Congress, and they didn't want to do all of that work, right? But I introduced it every year because it reminded me of what I was doing and why I was doing it, right? Um, so that's, that's how I've kind of kept myself in check. You didn't like 8,000-page bills? I hated 8,000-page bills. Who reads 8,000-page bills in 72 hours? I mean, we would like separate them. I remember sitting on the floor in my office with my staff members and interns, and I would say, okay, you've got this, you've got this, you've got this, you've got this, and then we'll figure out the rest. When we had bills that were several hundred pages and we were just trying to get, you know, get a full understanding of them. But it was just, how do you understand as a um, individual at home whether this is good for you if you can't get through the entire bill? And you've got members of Congress even admitting, well, sometimes you gotta, you know, you gotta pass it, right? That's that's inappropriate. And I'm not just saying, by the way, that's happened on both sides of the aisle. Let's just because that's the nature of Washington. I'm not criticizing one versus the other, but that that nonsense has to stop. Hi, my name is Ben Swan. Um, I'm a marketing and finance major. Uh, my question is, I recently heard an artist say that like no one's inherently political. You become political when it like affects you and there's a problem affecting you, which I feel like you could really relate to and that's how you kind of got into your career. Um, how would you say that you like handled that? Do you relate to that? And then when it comes for time for us to like step into our positions, whether that's politically or into a business that we're starting, how do you say that you handled that? Okay, that was a lot. So you said the artist said that no one's inherently political, that they become, well, um, if life is politics and, or policy, there's a difference between policy and politics, right? And if everyone is affected by policy, which in turn makes you political, right? Because in order to get policy through, you have to be able to communicate that and make it work through this political you know, cycle um, or through this political sphere or I would say vehicle, right? Through this political vehicle. Um, so how do you navigate that? I, I would say, first of all, everybody has an issue that they care about, right? Um, the first thing I would say is the way I navigate through that, right, is um, I had specific issues that I cared about going in and then I had issues that I found out that I cared about when I was in it. And um, they come from getting, being close to people and hearing their stories and trying to fix things for them. And you do everything that you possibly can to fix that issue. So let me give you an example, right? The environmental issues. You are not going to get anything done on a partisan, in a partisan way on environmental issues. And anybody who is trying to deal with those things just politically on one side of the aisle will not get anywhere. This has to become more of an American issue. And the reason why I became, I, I got, that became important to me is because I had people that said to me, I don't care who we work with. 
I just need someone that's going to hear me. And we started working together and I started caring about them and their issue and then that became an issue that I cared about. And I found out that a lot of times in Washington you have false choices. People are given, it's either or. You're either pro-environment or pro-energy production, which is not true. Right? We're, we're bigger than that. We're better than that. If we solved all of our problems versus, you know, white and, and, and black or, you know, they're, they're, there's always room in the middle where you can get a win-win. And um, when politics takes people out of the picture and doesn't take the advantage of actually, in other words, you have to decide whether the issue is more important to you or the power is more important to you. Because if the issue is more important to you, you shouldn't care who you work with. You want to get as many people to come along with you as possible. So becoming political is actually not the best thing you can do until you get as many people along with you as possible, right? You can't just cut people out. Anybody who's willing to help you, you should be, you should invite them to the table. Did that, was that, did that make sense? Hi, uh, I'm Quinn Gerber. I'm an information systems major. And I was wondering what is one of the habits or, pol or not policies, sorry, principles you live by that has brought you the most success or had the biggest influence on your life? Um, the whole leadership issue. That one's a simple one, the leadership issue. Um, going to places where it, it, it's really led me um, to, to really get become comfortable in uncomfortable spaces. Um, I went to the University of Chicago early on, right? Um, this is when uh, Barack Obama was president. Uh, he, that's, those are his stomping grounds. And I went to go speak to a group of aspiring black attorneys. And again, a lot of my advisors said, Mia, don't go. It's, it's a trap. You know, people are going to be recording. It's a horrible place. And I said, if I can't go into those places, then I really have no business doing this because I always felt like my job wasn't to just preach to the choir. My job was to get people to see my perspective or at least be able to give them a different perspective, right? So I went and I told them about my life and everybody seemed to be kind of respected, just kind of respected my life and what was going on and I told them about my parents coming from Haiti and this one woman stood up and she said, I don't know how you could be a black woman living in Utah in the Republican Party with the faith that you have in today's America. It makes absolutely no sense. You should be on the other side of the aisle. Shame on you. And I looked at her very calmly and I said, I am all of those things because I refuse to fit this mold that you and society tells me that I need to fit into. Imagine if Martin Luther King just took the fact that government said he was a second class citizen or we were second class citizen. You wouldn't be here today. So I'm not asking you to take on my policies. I'm not asking any of you to take on my policies. What I'm asking all of you to do, and that group of students, is to preserve your right to make decisions for yourself and to think for yourself. That's what I'm asking you to do. Because this country is stronger on all of those individual minds coming together and creating a more robust, diverse um, society. Diverse in looks, diverse in thought, diverse in culture. We're a lot stronger that way. We're not a country that everybody thinks the same and we're going to thrive that way. That's not how this works, right? So I'm saying the same thing. Don't take, don't fit this mold that society tells you to fit into. Create your own and then to preserve your ability to make decisions for yourself. Because I promise you, these minds here, there isn't anybody in Washington that's more qualified than you are. I've seen them. <laughs> I've worked with them. There isn't anyone in Washington that is going to be your savior. Right? So, is that the question? <laughs> it's a great response. I think that was the question. Get, un get comfortable in uncomfortable positions. Hi, I'm Julie Norman and I'm a econ master's student and I'm graduating in the spring. Yay. So if you need Yay. an employee, Yay. let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, if you had a magic wand that could change one policy at any branch of government, what would you change? One subject at a time. <laughs> Hands okay. down. 
one subject at a time, because one is we have, Congress has literally given away their Article I responsibilities, right? So what happens is, we'll take the financial crisis, for instance. Financial crisis, everybody's like, what did you guys do? What's going on? And they're like, you know what? We obviously, no one wants to take responsibility or do the work. So they say, we're going to create all of these bureaucracies, right? We're going to create all of these people, and they're going to define, you know, what sound fiscal economic um, policies we should have as a country, and they're going to write the rules and enforce them. The problem with that is they're not accountable to anybody. They're not elected by anybody. And so if we don't like what they're doing as people, we can't do anything about it. I can't tell you how many times people came up to us and said, hey, by the way, um, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, and they're writing some rules, and these, these really don't work in today's America. They don't work in our industry. And by the way, when somebody's doing something in Washington, it doesn't mean that it's actually working in real life, right? Um, so it, it's, it's one subject at a time. What that does is it puts the responsibility back in the hands of Congress and has them focus on one issue. And it also creates a balance of powers because the legislative branch have been giving away its powers for a very long time. And that's a simple way of getting people involved. If the bills are limited to one subject, then you and I can actually read through all of it, have been put, and tell our members of Congress whether we support it or not, instead of waiting for a big think tank that tells us, this is what, America, this is what they're doing to us. Hey, by the way, click $25 to donate, you know, and then we'll tell you your opinion on everything else. Right? Too many people, like whether it's Heritage Foundation on one side or whether it's like, you know, you name it, um, too many people are allowing these think tanks to make money and think for them. So for me, if I were to change one thing right now, it would be um, to do one subject at a time because I think that that would start changing the um, environment in Washington and actually create the balance of powers we're supposed to have between the legislative, judicial, and executive branch. That's great. My name is Ariana Keller, and I'm an accounting major. Mm -hmm. I am wondering, what is one aspect of leadership that's been maybe a little bit more difficult for you, and how have you worked through overcoming it? Aspect of leadership that's been difficult for me. Well, that's a good question. Um, I would say that the things that have been difficult for me is really, in some cases, practicing what I preach. Sometimes I don't, I have to catch myself and um, think through what other people are saying or trying to look through their lens. I'm not always good at it, even though I know I'm supposed to do it. Because there, uh, let me be fair, there are some people that really bug me and annoy me. Um, and I just, you know, because, and, and, and it's because I sat, I, I sit there and uh, like last night we were reading through um, just some of the policies. I'm going to put my son-in-law on the uh, on the soapbox here, or on on. Anyway, we were just kind of. He was he was getting frustrated. We were leading, We were reading through some policies and statements that were made by people who aren't elected by us, right? And creating some rules. Um, and I just really got frustrated and assume, you know, that these people are just trying to control us. And there are times where I have to sit back and just kind of think through some things myself, right? And say all right, I wonder what perspective they're coming from. Um, I, I need to do a better job at that, but there are times where people come off the bat and they say things and I automatically just shut the door um, because I think I, I, I think I have an idea of what their character is like when, when you really don't until you really dive in, right, and get to know somebody. So, I mean, those things will continue to frustrate me and most of the time, um, you know, you, I, I kind of, my first instincts are right, but a lot of times they're not. And those times that they're not, they make a difference. So it's worth, it's worth giving people a chance. So practicing what I preach is difficult, right? You know you're supposed to do something, and it's not always easy to do it. I think we have time for one more. Make it a good one. 
I'll try my best. No uh, pressure. <laughs> okay. My name is Samantha Young, and I'm a marketing major. And my question is, how do you think that we as an American society can combat the spread of misinformation that has become so common? Girl. Oh, God. <laughs> we'll be here for another two hours. Wow. That was a good question, though. That was a great question. Um, how can we stop? Okay. You can only control yourself. You're not going to be able to force people to do what you want them to do. So we can't stop the spread of misinformation, but we can decide what kind of information we take in and what kind of information we put out. So I think that that's the first thing, right? We need to hold ourselves accountable. We need to make sure that any information we are putting out is, is um, that we believe is good, right, necessary. And also, we don't have to be jerks when we put out information too, right? We can be a little more civil, which I think this country needs. Let's remember, we're all Americans. And there are people out there that want to kick our butts, that want to see us fail. Most of the countries that we're competing against, they're not our friends. They would love for the United States to just completely collapse. Let's realize that, okay? And the other thing I want to say is this. If we love ourselves and we love this country, we need to start loving each other a little bit more because when we are up against those enemies, it's us side by side that are going to have to deal with that issue, right? And the best way that another country can defeat us is if we're doing it to, our, to each other. It's the best way. I mean, listen, these other countries really have nothing on us in terms of where our demographics are, where we are, you, you think about econ, you think about all of these other, they really don't have anything on us except for what they have is the power to help us destroy each other. And sometimes I think they're winning. So information, Remember that when you give out information and you're putting out information, you're putting it out to the person that is going to be a partner in this world battle, right, um, in, in preservation. And the other thing I would also say is, um, you know, I've always been, I think that we could do a little bit better communicating with each other, right? And communicating is not shouting at each other. That's not communication. I talk to my um, group here with CGO about this all the time. Well... The two times we've met, or the one time we've met. <laughs> but we're going to talk about this all the time. <laughs> the communication is not me talking at you. Communication is an exchange of thoughts, ideas, and emotions that make us move to do something right. And so we have a responsibility. The administration has a responsibility to communicate effectively with us, but we have an, uh, a responsibility to communicate truth and to communicate things in a way that we're not destroying each other. That is a perfect ending. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.